Hello there, I'm Rita Verde, Yards Consortium Board President, and I'd like to welcome you to our September 2022 membership meeting. We'd like to invite those of you who aren't members already to become members of the Arts Consortium, or if you know of someone who is not a member, please invite them, let them know of all the activities and events and things that we have going. In fact, later in this meeting, you'll be hearing from our Executive Director, Ampelio Mejia, who will be updating you on those fantastic and wonderful events and activities that we have going. We also would like to invite you to become part of our artist master list. Uh, those of you who are artists, um, very simple to do. Just go on our website and access it. All you have to do is put your name, uh, your medium, and your information, your contact information, and it could very well mean a commission for you. We know we have very many talented artists in the Central Valley and we'd like to continue uh, developing our artist master list. So thank you for those who have participated already and we look forward to those who have not yet had that opportunity. Also, if you'd like to um, advertise any of your events, would you please go to hello at artsconsortium.org and we will gladly uh, promote and uh, list those activities that you have going. There's a oh, a very important presentation that we will be giving to you in a moment here. Dave Daniels, uh, excellent presenter on strategies and staging ideas on how to promote and uh, stage your artwork for the Taste the Arts that's coming up on October the 15th, 2022. That's coming up really, really soon. Uh, please make sure you listen to the entire presentation. It is a wonderful one, gives great ideas. Uh, we'd like to also thank the uh, Arts Visalia for partnering with us for uh, First Friday. Thank you so much. A big shout out to them. We appreciate that. Our next membership meeting is on October the 11th, Tuesday. Right now we're still doing virtual meetings because a lot of you are still on vacation. Um, the weather is factoring in now. So as soon as we get our uh, in-person meetings going, we will make sure to let you know about those. Um, we are thinking of also continuing uh, conducting our, our meetings, not only in person, but virtually in the near future. We thank you so much for tuning in, for uh, attending our virtual meeting. There's a lot of work that goes into these uh, virtual meetings and uh, recording them. So we thank you so much and we will see you soon. Thank you so much. Hey everybody, my name is Dave Daniels. I'm a woodworker and I own Absolution Woodworks, which is a, a boutique wood shop here in Visalia, California. Uh, I specialize in building custom furniture, fine art cutting boards, and what I like to call highly specific objects for highly specific people. Uh, I'm here today to give you a little presentation on how to sell your stuff at the Tasty Arts Festival. Tasty Arts Festival has been one of the highlights of my year. It's usually the first big kickoff for the holiday season for me, and it's always been a really successful market, um, and I've really enjoyed being there. And so I figured today, as I've done in years past, I'd share with you some of the things that I think have worked well for me that you can try. Uh, I'm not an expert, but I have done quite a few of these over the years and, and have had some success at it. So here we go. I'll start off by showing you a little bit of my work uh, here are a couple of furniture pieces. So the large piece is a cedar dining table that I made for a, a family here in, in Visalia. Um, the smaller piece is a coffee table with featuring old growth redwood um, in, a, in the style of George Nakashima. Here are a couple more coffee table pieces, a cedar round and then an English walnut round. I try to use local and salvaged wood as much as possible uh, in my work. And we have a lot of really interesting and, and cool types of wood around to work with. English walnut being one of my favorites. And here's a sample of some of my ingrained cutting boards, what I call fine art cutting boards. They're somewhere between functional art. So it's, it could be an art piece on its own, but it could also be used. And that feature I found actually has helped me out in, in environments like Taste the Arts, which I'll touch on in a, in a minute in, in my presentation. Okay. Now, one of the things that I think has been important for my success, and I think will be important for your success in really any field that you choose, and that is a commitment to quality. So 
I, a couple of years ago, uh, I was putting things together, having some success, but um, I wasn't selling very well at things like farmer's market. People would say, hey, that looks good, keep, keep it up, and then they would walk away. They wouldn't actually commit to buying it. I made to myself a commitment. I said, hey, I'm going to step it up. I'm going to make sure the quality of the stuff that I'm making is good and that it's at a level that, that I can say, yes, I did everything I could in that piece to make it as good as it could be. I decided I'm going to commit myself to quality. And at that point, people started going, hey, that's great. I'll take it home with me and buying it. Uh, and there my sales started to take off. And that was 100% that commitment to quality. I was still creating the same types of things. I just did it better, more effectively, maybe more, more uniquely in some ways. And this is a, a, a facet of successful people, of artists, business people, whoever you name it, if they've been successful in, in their field, they have committed themselves to the quality of their craft, to being the best that they can be at their craft, and doing what it takes uh, to, to be the best, to, to do the best that they can. So you'll see that in my presentation um, coming out over and over, and, and whenever I talk about my work. Um, so really think about that. If, if you find that every time you set up, people are walking by, think about the things that you can do to improve your art and, and take it as a, a learning process. So now we'll get into some of the kind of nitty-gritty, hands-on things uh, that you can do in your setup, specifically at Taste the Arts or really any, any place where you're going to be in person showing your work. Um, now, generally, I've kind of thought this through. Um, when you're trying to sell something, there are a handful of things you can do. Uh, obviously, you have a product. So I know it's kind of hard. It kind of hurts a little bit to think of your art as a product. But in this case, if you're trying to sell it, it's a product. Um, so when anybody's making a product, you want that product to be hopefully something unique. Uh, maybe I'm able to create something that nobody else can, and therefore I'm the only person who can sell that thing. So you have your own little corner on the market. Or if you can't make something that's entirely unique, maybe you can make it better. So maybe you can take your art and you can do a better job of it than the person next to you. You know, uh, it's, it's your way of standing out. Or you can make something cheaper. So maybe you can do the same quality, same kind of thing, but maybe you can do it for a price that's a little bit cheaper. Um, or you can do all three of those things. So maybe you can make something that's unique, it's high quality, and you can do it at a, at a place that's, that's reasonable. Now, as you grow and your skills develop and you begin to create your own niche and your own market, you can worry a little bit less about how, you know, how cheap something is priced. And that's kind of where I'm at these days is I'm less worried about the price point, although I do want to have some inherent value, and more interested in making something that's high quality uh, and something unique. But again, again, you've got to have that commitment to quality. So if, if the thing you're making is not good, uh, if it's not cool, then people aren't going to want to buy it. Uh, but if it's high quality and it's a, if, if it's of a good value, somebody will probably want to buy that. Again, commit yourself to quality. Now, let's, let's think about the actual setup, the day of. So when you get to Taste the Arts, um, what, what should you be doing? These are things that I've figured out um, that, that have been successful for me. The first thing is you want to display your items well. So if you have awesome art, but people can't see it, then they're probably not going to come over uh, and, and check out your stuff. If it doesn't look cool in your space, um, people are going to be less enticed to go there. Okay, so here's one of my pieces as an example. This is an a ingrain cutting board featuring hickory and black walnut. Now, when I first started out, you know, early on in my art, art career, I guess, uh, I used to just pull out my cutting boards and, and plunk them flat on the table. Now, when somebody's walking by, they're not going to be able to see what, what I've got here. They're going to have to come out of their way, walk over to the table, stand over it, and then look around. Now, if, if you're like me, I'm not, probably not going to go out of my way to see their art uh, if it's not accessible to me. Now, if I take this cutting board and I turn it up and I display it prominently in a place in my booth where somebody could see it, then they're going to be able to be casually walking by down the road 
they're going to see something and they'll say, hey, that looks interesting. Let me, let me go ahead and, and, and cruise over there and, and check it out. Um, I also sometimes will, will display my work. If I'm just doing a table setup, I'll use these plate holders to display my work. I also have some racks that I bring out. Um, and and those, those give me a little more levels uh, to display my work. And then I found that as soon as I started showing these things, uh, displaying my work more, more visibly from the street, that people will walk, they'll pass by, they'll turn their head, stop, do a double take, and then they'll come back and they'll come and check out my stuff. So you're going to want to think about that for your art. Your stuff is going to be different than mine because you're probably doing different things. Uh, think about the way you can set up your space. Maybe you want to create a miniature art gallery. Uh, maybe you want it to be more like a studio where you're actually you know, standing, standing there painting and your work is around. Think about ways to, to make your items interesting and easily visible from a casual passerby standpoint. Okay? All right, next point. See if you can offer a variety of price points for your art. Uh, this will give people the opportunity to purchase something uh, without spending a fortune or potentially the first purchase in a series of purchases they'll make as they get to know you. Um, I'm going to put up a slide here. This is from one of my favorite artists. His name is Dave Quiggle. Dave Quiggle is a, is a tattoo artist out of Southern California. He also does um, album art and just other art pieces. Here's uh, a poster he did for Queens of the Stone Age on the left uh, and then a Donald Duck inspired piece uh, for a, a Disney event he did. And in the middle, here's a piece of his art, uh, a tattoo art, a guy with a massive back piece tattoo. And so when I look at that, I see, yeah, dude, that tattoo is rad, it's huge, it's intense. I would love, I would love seeing that on somebody. Probably, first of all, couldn't afford it, but also didn't have the guts to do it. Um, but uh, hey, I look at the, the Daffy Duck Square. I like that. That's cool. Let's see how much that's priced. Probably priced around, I don't know, 20, 40 bucks for a print. Hey, that's something I can do. Um, and so in that case, Dave Quiggle is really cool in that way that he has these higher end products. In this case, a huge tattoo piece or um, more, more easily accessible prints for kind of the casual observer to buy and enjoy his work. Uh, in my case, I offer things uh, at my booth from anywhere from like $30 or $40. $30 is typically like the, the cheapest item I have. All the way on, on up, if I have a piece of furniture, it could be you know a few thousand dollars depending on what I bring. Uh, and then everything in between. Now, keep in mind that in the middle of October, people are starting to think about Christmas. And I found that from the $50 to $100 range, that is the, the money spot for Christmas gifts. Um, people are willing to, to shell that out for a, a quality Christmas gift. Okay, so give yourself and your customers a variety of price points so that they can, they can choose how much they want to spend. All right, next point, functional items sell. Um, this is something that can be tough for artists, especially if you're a painter. Um, you know, you want to think about, is there a way to make my art usable so that a person can justify purchasing it? For, for more than just an aesthetic purpose. And this is something where, where I kind of have an advantage, as I kind of mentioned or alluded to earlier. I have a cutting board here. Functionally, this could work as a cutting board. Or this could also be displayed as a piece of art. It's both. Probably half of my cutting boards actually never get cut on. Um, but people, as they're standing in my booth, they can justify the expense, you know, potentially a couple hundred dollars on, on a cutting board. Uh, they can justify that expense because they're saying, hey, I can use that. There is a function behind this, even if they never do. Now, one thing I like to use as an example of this, this is a, a piece of art that I carry with me virtually every day. And here's a close-up for you. Uh, this is a keychain. It's a, it's a fork that has been heated up and then uh, twisted around into a functional piece of art. I carry this with me every day. It's, it's on the keychain to my totally rad... Toyota Sienna, the sweetest car uh, anybody ever needs. I'll fight you if you don't agree with me. Um, but there you go. That's a functional piece of art. Now, this is something that's cool, that is at an accessible price point, and it's useful. It helps me keep track of my keys. Now, 
While I'm checking out that guy's booth, I'm thinking, hey, I could use that. That's cool. I can also, might be tempted to buy a, an art piece. So here's a, another piece from the same artist. This is the diet fork. All right, so he's, he's taking a fork, and, and this is not a functional piece, really, although I suppose it could be if you really were serious about your diet. Um, and I also have this in my house. I don't use this every day, but since I was there, I decided to pick up two pieces. So there you go, functional items sell. So use your creative mind to think of ways that you can make your art functional without making it cheap. Um, and, and that can be your challenge, right? You don't want to you don't want to sell out, but you do want to create your art in an accessible way that somebody can, can justify buying it. Okay. Next point. Sell an experience. This could cover a wide variety of things for you. This is your opportunity to, to create an experience. Like I alluded to earlier, maybe you want to be in your studio that you've transported to Taste the Arts and you're, you're working on site. So when people come into the art, uh, into your space, they're seeing the art being made or in motion. Um, maybe you, you create a little environment with incense and, and mood music um, and nice fluffy rugs. Uh, to create an experience. That's not just, hey, I've got this stuff, it's here, it's for sale, right? Um, but but they're, they're experiencing something when they walk up to you. The example I'll use for that, I had a very surreal experience in Santa Fe, New Mexico, at the Georgia, or the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. And one of the pieces that struck me was a piece called City Night. Um, the canvas is probably seven feet by four feet. It's this massive, intense uh, painting of a city landscape. You know, these, these buildings, when you walk into, the, into the, the room, the first thing you see is this massive, massive painting, and it's just towering over you. You feel dominated by, by these, like, bleak landscape. So when I walked into that, I was like, dude, this is intense. I love it. That is so rad. When I got to the gift shop, I found this, this print. This print's not very cool. It's like a, a $20 print. It totally does not capture the real feeling of the piece, but it does remind me of that experience, and that's why I bought this. So when I walked into that museum, I felt something real and interesting, and I wanted to remember that, and purchasing this print was a way for me to do that. Um, so when I look at this print and I hang it in my living room, I'm reminded of that experience. So you can do that as well in your own art space. So perhaps you are very charismatic or you're interesting or you're doing something in your space that's really unique and cool and somebody will want to take a piece of that home with them so that they can remember that experience. That's up to you to kind of figure out what that's like. Going along with making an experience for the people who are for uh, attending your event. You can also think about ways to make your booth interactive. Now, that can be as simple as you interacting with the people who come into your booth. And I think that's actually a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, most people are intimidated by artists. Artists are weird. I mean, I'm sorry guys, it's true. Um, people don't know how you think or why you do the things that you do. And they probably don't understand the art you're making. So. This is your opportunity to invite them in. You want to interact with them. Uh, say hello. Say, what do you think? It, all these different ways to pull them in. That's a really simple way to make it interactive. One of the things I have are these magnetic bottle openers. Um, and, and this is just a really simple way to get something in their hands and interacting with something. So these are displayed like right, right by where they would walk past so that they can come and they see it and then they can Oh, fiddle with it. Oh, hey, these bottle caps will just stick to the bottle opener. That's pretty cool. And then they get kind of drawn into the rest of the stuff that's there. That's an easy way for somebody to interact with, your, with, with my work. And then I'll go in and tell them a little bit about how I made it, um, the things that are involved with that, and then there you go. You've got an interactive experience. Anytime somebody's interacting with your work, they're going to be more drawn to it and more interested in, in potentially taking something home with them. Um, that's another opportunity where you can, you can be maybe doing your art in, in your space if that's, if that's possible. Or maybe you can invite them and have them do their art too, or, or create their own art. Um, think of all these ways to make your work interactive. 
beyond the day of the festival. Um, so this is a great opportunity for you to get out in front of a bunch of people who have never seen you before um, and who don't know you. It's your way to introduce yourself to a broad audience. A lot of people come to this festival. Um, so think about ways that you can interact with them beyond that day. So I always have business cards, which is a really simple way to like, hey, boom, take my card. Often people won't ever call you, but at least you're giving them the option. I found that social media, just saying, hey, I've got an Instagram account, Facebook account, check me out there. A lot of people will, will actually follow up with that. Just different ways to network. You could have a, a sign-up sheet for a newsletter if you do one of those. Um, thinking about those, those things. I've had a lot of leads generated through my face-to-face -face interaction with people. Even if they don't buy something the day of, they'll come back later on. Um, and I've heard of, of experiences where somebody saw an artist piece, you know, taste the arts, and then four years later they finally ended up buying something from them. So, so they are thinking about you. Um, so, so don't worry if you don't make the initial sale. My last point in sort of these, these ways to make the most of your show, my last big point, uh, is one of emphasizing the importance of customer service. Um, this is your opportunity to totally destroy everything you've done before. If you've displayed your items beautifully, you have the world's greatest painting in the world. Um, it's a little redundant, but deal with it. You have a wonderful interactive experience, but if you're a jerk, the people are going to leave. They're not going to be interested in you or your art or spending money with you. Um, go out of your way to be yourself. Now, the, I, my impression is that people are looking for an honest um, like a legit interaction with, with you. They don't want some, some phony version of you, but, but you know, give them a, a good customer service experience. Okay, cool. Now, here are some practical things. Uh, practical things to, to help you, whatever. Okay, I'm gonna start over. Here are a few practical things that I found uh, that will help you immensely. Uh, first off, display your best work prominently. That's going to be the anchor that somebody walking around the street will see, they'll grab it, and want to come in. So if you have a really big, massive piece, so I might, in, in years past, I brought out a dining table and displayed that very prominently, and it's very striking. And people will want to come up and see that, and then they might come and see some of the smaller items. You're going to want to think of a way to do that for, for your own work. Now, the next practical piece of advice is really important, especially for art, and that's to price, uh, to clearly price your items so that people can see how much something costs without having to ask you. Um, art is a really funny thing. Sometimes art's worth uh, $20 or for sale for $20. Other times it's $20,000 and there's everything in between and it seems kind of arbitrary how some artists price their things to the casual observer, somebody who's not an art uh, enthusiast on a normal day. Um, take a little sticker, write a number on there that you want to get for it, and put it on somewhere on the piece so that they know this is how much this is. Now, let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, I was in Santa Barbara, and my wife and I had spent the whole day in, in galleries checking out some amazing art by international artists priced anywhere from like $3,000 to $30,000. All of it was sweet. All of it I wished I could own, but obviously, as a meager, honest, humble woodworker, I don't make that kind of money. Uh, now, later on, we were feeling a little tired, we needed an afternoon pick-me-up. We found ourselves in Dune Coffee Shop in Santa Barbara. You should go there if you haven't. It's rad. Delicious coffee. Now, on the wall was this amazing work of art. All right, we have the pizza brain skull. It's got everything about art and me that I love. It's got pizza. I love pizza. I love to eat food. It's got skulls. It's got tattoo-inspired art. It's super cool. It's weird. And I looked on the wall. I'm thinking, dude, I've seen all this expensive art. There's no way I could afford this. It's probably like $700. The sticker on it was $200. And it's a big piece. It's like four feet by two and a half feet. It's a big piece. But hey, 200 bucks, I can afford that. Now, had 
there not been a sticker on there, I probably would have been like, ah, I can't afford it. And I would have left. I guarantee you that's what would have happened. But since there was a sticker on it, hey, this is something I can afford. I love it. I'm going to take it home. So put price tags on your art so that people know how much it is. If they don't know how much it is, they probably won't ask you how much it is uh, because they're going to think it's $40,000 because that's the way art is. So, so make it easy for them. All right, another really simple thing that you can do is to take credit cards um, or Venmo now. I've been using Venmo a lot lately, and people have, have really liked that, and it's a really easy way to exchange money. Um, I try and take any form of money possible, cash, check, Venmo, credit card, uh, all seashells, whatever is worth money. Like, I'll do it. Like, I don't care as long as I can somehow generate income to put in my bank. I'm good with it. Um, there are a variety of options. You can check those out. I use PayPal here, and it comes with a card reader, and it goes straight to my PayPal account. There's Square. Um, there's a whole bunch of, of options. But bottom line is most people aren't carrying cash, especially a couple hundred dollars worth of cash, unless they're a very specific type of person. Um, so, so make it as easy for them as possible to spend their money with you. Now, I'm the kind of person who will go to a gas station, and if I find out that the, the, the gas meter is not taking credit cards, like, I'm gone. I'm leaving. I'm going to the next gas station. I don't need gas that bad. Like, that's the kind of person I am, and I guarantee you other people are as well. Um, so just make it as easy as possible for them to, to give you money. All right, finally, the last thing. Huge thing, do not pack up early. Okay, don't pack up early. This is something that over the years has, has been really critical both to you and then for the people around you. Now, I've had shows where I haven't sold, like I've spent three days, haven't sold anything. And I'm just sitting there, dude, like totally bummed out. Man, what a waste of my weekend. I spent a bunch of money to come here. I could have been making stuff. And then come the last hour, end up selling 10 large cutting boards. Boom. My day made, my week made, my month has just been made. And that's because I stuck it out. I stayed in there and I committed to the, to the time of the event. You never know who's going to be walking by and you want to be ready for it. Now, beyond that, that's a simple courtesy thing. So if, if somebody across the street is starting to pack up, chances are that, that kind of thing is like contagious. People are going to think, oh, the event's over. And then the people walking around, casual observer, are like, oh, I thought this was over at 2 or whatever, are going to think, oh, the event's over. And then they're going to take off. So it's a real bummer when people start packing up early. And you could be missing out on an incredible opportunity. Just commit to it. Even if your day didn't go well, stick it out, both for you for your potential in, in, in the next 20 minutes or so, and also for the people who are also trying to sell their work. Don't pack up early. Okay, finally, wrap up. After the event, um, use it as a learning experience. What went well? What didn't go well? What did you enjoy? What didn't you enjoy? Be thinking about these ways that you can improve. Um, what things sold, what things didn't sell. All that kind of stuff. Also remember that after the event, theoretically, the event's not over. You could have generated a lead. Um, a couple years ago, I did a home show up in Fresno. Total bomb. The event sucked for me. Three days. That, that's kind of the three-day event that I was thinking about. Didn't work. But hey, a guy from the solar booth across the way saw my stuff. We chatted a little bit. He's like, cool, I'll take your card. Call me back a week later, and he commissioned a multi-thousand dollar event or a multi-thousand dollar piece for his kitchen. Sweet. Totally worth going to that event now. So just because it's over, it doesn't necessarily mean it's over. So keep that in mind. All right. And finally, I'm going to drive this point home again, and that is your commitment to quality. You have got to commit yourself to quality, both in your art, in your craft, also in the experience that you're creating for the people who are attending the event. Okay, finally, the last point, I'm going to drive this home one more time. You 
are going to want to commit yourself to quality. Again, commit to quality. I can't stress that point enough. If you are committed to quality in your craft, in your art, in the environment and experience that you're creating for the people who attend your event or, or come and see you in your studio, I promise you that will lead you to success in the future. Whatever it is that you choose to do, commit yourself to quality and it won't lead you astray. Thank you guys so much. My name again is Dave. Uh, I, I run Absolution Woodworks. You can find my work on social media, uh, Facebook and Instagram, Absolution Woodworks at Absolution Co. Shoot me an email. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to help you out. Uh, and I'll see you at Taste the Arts. Welcome, everybody, to the Arts Consortium's membership meeting for September. My name is Antelio Mejia Perez, and I am the executive director of the Arts Consortium, Tulare County's Arts Council. Today, we're going to talk about public art, we're going to talk about county projects, we're going to talk about Tasty Arts, and we're going to talk about the South Valley Art Tour. So uh, with public art, we want to thank everybody that has been coming to our meetings uh, because, of the, because of that momentum, because of that excitement. Um, and I know I wasn't, I guess I wasn't super clear with the, the, the goal of, of that last meeting, uh, but it was to get a feeling for the real, the real desire for public art here in our, in our community. And there is a, there is a great desire. And we are finally at the point where we are going to be putting out a call for proposals and we are looking to pay 500 300 and 200 dollars to the top three proposals now that's just the proposal and so they should be at 112th scale they should be um, looking to be placed somewhere in downtown visalia this call for proposals is going to be looking for an iconic wow factor uh, it could be something inspirational it could be something provocative uh, it could be something historical. It uh, uh, doesn't necessarily have to do with Visalia, but it has to have that wow factor. So think about that, again, for downtown Visalia. Uh, we're looking for a permanent long-term piece proposal. We're looking for uh, something that shows that the artist knows how to install a piece of work. We, we want it to be a positive thing. You know, We're looking for a positive piece that makes people feel good when they see it, uh, something that makes them, makes them sit and contemplate something. Uh, I, I've, been, I've really been happy that there have been uh, more applications to the Art Outdoors grant uh, funding. That is a one-time funding source. Once it's gone, it's gone. We're going to try to find more, but uh, that's that's it. So uh, keep applying, and uh, and and we'll we'll keep uh, we'll keep letting you know how you do. We're looking in the city. I say, if any other cities in the county are interested in public art and would like to work with us uh, to, to realize it, then uh, please give us a call at 559-772-0001. For uh, our county projects right now, what we have going on is we are finalizing the agreement for the uh, bridge over Traver Canal, which Frances Piles is working on, or will, she will be working on once we get that agreement finalized with the county. And we also have uh, an upcoming uh, new call for for pieces at the government plaza show so these are things that I'm letting you know because you're members of the arts consortium you're coming to our meetings so you're gonna get this information ahead of time it will come out in a, a few weeks what's happening right now are our Mooney Grove murals I was talking to you about those over the winter I was telling you guys to think of a four foot by eight foot panel that you could come up with in a few days and so now it's happening I want to congratulate all of our artists for being a part of such an amazing collection of beautiful work. I'm going to be playing all of the art pieces here uh, at the end of the video so you can see every single one of the mural submissions and uh, I want to congratulate Heidi Steinman, Jana Botkin, Joy Collier, Katie Kamalian, and uh, Vena Design Studios for having an image selected for a mural. This is amazing. This is actual color on, on County Parks property. I don't know how exciting that is to anybody else but um, the, each one of these artists received $2,000 uh, for budget, right? Uh, we were going to do it all over the weekend of September 9th through the 12th. We had everything ready to go, and then we saw those 113 degree temperatures. So uh, actually, Jenna was, was really, uh, really smart and said, you know what, it's pretty hot. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we try to, try to extend this a little bit? And so, so we're working with, uh, with those folks, but we had some diehards who said, you know what, 
we're going to go out there and we're going to get it done. And uh, so Joy Collier and uh, and Vayna Design Studios, thank you so much for, for pulling through. Uh, your pieces look beautiful. Yeah. So the, the Koi Pond at Mooney Grove, uh, I kind of touched on it when we were talking about public art. I want to, I do want to uh, talk about that because uh, I've had a couple people ask about it. So we went through all that just like we're doing right now with the proposals and we had every intention. We had all the budget set aside. Um, unfortunately, there were community members who felt that, the, that they wanted to preserve the fountain. Um, I'm not sure if they were aware or not of the state of decay of the fountain. Um, and so it was going to cost something about like $400,000 to restore the fountain and, and get it back to operating, operating form. Um, obviously the county was weighing, you know, between $15,000 to beautify the fountain and 400 something thousand dollars to restore it. Um, they wanted, they wanted to go for, for the beautification option. But, uh, again, uh, we had community members who had strong opposition, so they were given, uh, to, they were given some time to, to collect funds. And so, uh, I believe that we're still, we're still kind of waiting on, on uh, whether or not they're, they're going to be able to raise those funds. And so uh, the county just wants to make sure that everybody's opinions are, are taken into account. Since then, we've, uh, we've created three awesome bridges. We've put art up in about three different uh, county facilities. And now uh, we're doing the murals at the park, which are really not going to stop. So uh, my, uh, my faith uh, in, in, in the, the growing desire for public art is, is pretty strong. And uh, I hope yours is as well. Uh, we're going to keep working at it. Taste the arts. Taste the Arts is here. Uh, just like every year for you artists and arts organizations that are participating, we're going to put up the canopies. We're going to take them down. You don't have to worry about that. We're going to have volunteers helping set up in the morning. Uh, we will, we should already know from you whether or not you need some help setting up. Uh, if you haven't told us yet, please let us know either through email at uh, hello at arsconsortium.org or through the uh, phone call. Well, our phones are having, I don't know if you've noticed this, but pretty much all of downtown Visalia is having internet issues. And I hadn't really talked to anybody about it. I was, I was just kind of struggling on my own. And then I went and walked around and uh, everybody's having a hard time. So if you're calling us it, uh, and, and you're not getting through, it's because of our internet uh, issues. So just email us because, because emails are a lot easier to do than a static phone call. All right, so Taste the Arts. Uh, there are still artist re booth registrations available. If you haven't signed up yet, $75 for non-members, $50 for Arts Consortium members. The Arts Consortium's Taste the Arts Festival for 2022 is back, and we are excited. Uh, this year, we're going to feature all the way up north on Garden Street, at, right north of Oak. We're going to have the Arts Consortium's 2022 Artist of the Year, Francisco Alonso, um, doing some awesome steamrolling prints. Uh, he and his uh, COS print work students have been working on these uh, two foot by three foot carvings and we're gonna lay them on the ground, we're gonna have interactive inking and then he's gonna drive over them with the steamroller and we're gonna have these beautiful giant prints. And then coming on down to the youth's art stage we're gonna have Rave Dance Complex, Tico Theater Company, Sierra Performing Arts Center. Uh, we're going to have the Arts Consortium's Quick Draw. We're going to have Triple Threat, Kids Edition Dynamics, Dance Arts. And then we're going to end the, uh, the afternoon with Grace uh, Note Music Studios uh, showcasing all of their talented kids, uh, which is going to be pretty awesome. This year, our main stage is going to be in Garden Street Plaza, which is going to be kind of fun. And so we're going to set up more of a cafe setup at the stage with Sharks of Dance, Day's Baby, Watson, Lazare, and Jonathan Lofi. We're really, really excited. Thanks, Sound and Vision. And if you haven't checked it out, they're advertising a, a concert coming up, uh, Benefit, so they can do their kids' session. Uh, Jonathan Lang, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, check them out. Check it. Sound and Vision's always got cool things going on, so check them out. All day free activities that we're looking forward to at Taste the Arts are at Booth 314, COS Printworks Interactive, free small block printings. So those are the ones that you get to choose off the table and roll yourself. There's still going to be the steamrolling thing going on, but this one's just those small block prints. Then My Voice Media Center is collaborating with the Visalia Wellness Center, who is located on Tulare and Lover's Lane, if you've never been there. Beautiful, beautiful space, wonderful people. Uh, we're putting together a free art cafe 
which is going to be a little bit more interactive. We're going to let people walk into our, our booth if you've never been there. Again, booth 219. So that's um, right uh, between Gar uh, sorry, right between Oak and Center Avenues uh, in that middle area there. Free Art Cafe, you walk in, register, sign up. You can sit down and do some art activities and then uh, get your picture taken. We're, we're even going to have some guitar sessions and drawing sessions featured by uh, Thomas Fetch, our guitar facilitator for the My Voice Media Center, and Bronson Combs, our drawing facilitator for the My Voice Media Center. Then, uh, right across the street, we're going to have the Visalia Farmer's Market at booth 220. Thank you so much, Angie, for all your help with the Food Sculpture Challenge every year. Uh, we really, really appreciate you. On uh, booth 201, the Creative Center is doing some face painting, so go out there, say hi to Micah and the gang, and get your face painted. And then in booth 202, the Tulare Historical Museum is doing a mask making workshop. They're going to do some, some teddy bear masks. So go over there, say, say hi to Don Sabala. She's the new executive director of the Tulare Historical Museum. We're really happy to have them. Uh, the, then in booth 129, our awesome every year Grace Note Music Studios Instrument Petting Zoo. If you've ever been curious about how instruments work, get out there. Check it out. The instrument Petting Zoo is exactly what it sounds like. They put out a bunch of instruments from trumpets, pianos, guitars, bass, standing bass, and you just get to play with them. Check them out. They have their their staff there to, to tell you a little bit about them and uh, and invite you over to their to their space. Then, uh, booth 130, we're going to have Antonio Cuellar doing interactive ceramics. Uh, he is awesome. He'll have some wheels out there for people to throw on if you don't know what ceramics is about. This is the way, uh, the way to do it. Get your hands dirty. Get them in there. Uh, we're really, really excited for all this stuff. And just in case I didn't mention it, our Sound and Vision Foundation's main stage at Garden Street Plaza um, will have uh, Sharks of Dance, Day's Baby, Watson, Les Air, and Jonathan Lofi. South Valley Art Tour happening March 25th and 26th of 2023. We will be putting out more information in the coming months. Registration will open at Taste the Arts. So if you're interested in joining us for the South Valley Art Tour, uh, make, sure to, make sure to sign up. And uh, one thing that we do have to note is our graphic designer, Ed, is moving on to greener pastures. We're so happy for him, and we're so thankful for all of the work that he's done for us. These beautiful, keepsake-worthy magazines and uh, and catalogs we're we're gonna miss him so much and we're gonna miss his work so much uh and and how that why that matters for the south valley art tour is because we're gonna be pulling back on the graphics quite a bit uh, but we're still gonna make sure that these uh, are are high high quality um pieces for you to uh to use as a as reference and map to the to the show to the south valley art tour show so if you have any other questions uh please let us know if you have any announcements, please send them to us. Otherwise, um, we're really, really excited about all the things we have going on right now that we spoke about and all the other things that we're going on. Uh, so keep coming to the membership meetings. This is where you get the information first. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can keep up to date. You can ask us questions. And, uh, yeah, thank you all so much. Have a lovely day.
the king. We will keep this fire burning day and night. In the holy name of the king, there's a ring of fire burning day and night. And in the song we used to sing, we'll keep this fire burning in a fire. Burn, burn.